Hello and welcome to episode 169 of Ferg on the Freak. I'm that bloke from Rugby League Project, Andrew Ferguson. You can find me on Twitter, at AndrewRP. And joining me is the voluptuous League Freak, <laughs> <laughs> at League Freak. How you going there, mate? <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> oh, man. I've never been called voluptuous before, but... I guess there's I guess there's worse things. There's something I would really love to say right now, and I know if I say it, I will get in so much trouble. So I'm not going to say it. Uh, I just sat there thinking, what's the word I'm going to use for this one? I, mm. I thought about started laughing just before I pressed record. I'm going to have to say it. I'm going to piss myself laughing before it happens, and I'll ruin it. Anytime someone says you're voluptuous, you're fat. Have a salad. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you're anything but. Thank you. Thank that you. Ass. I love it when you lie to me. That ass, man. Um, it's a badonka donk. <laughs> well, it's been a, uh, it's been an intriguing few weeks. We've, we've not really dabbled into the news too much for the last few weeks because we we're just getting a bit irritated by the lack of actual rugby league content and the amount of garbage journalism going on. Mm, yeah. So we thought about approach some of it today because we just got to catch up a bit and get it out of our systems yeah and i reckon uh what do you reckon we lead in with the sparta kick well that sounds like a great idea doesn't it i love a fucking sparta kick it's great um Um, so the i think the, the lead in there is um there's a video of someone whose face you can't see uh kicking someone in the head and we're led to believe it's cody walker if you Did had a shot, him in the have, head. I thought it was well, his kicked, back. Well, he kicked him somewhere. Okay. Um, if Cody Walker had to shut his mouth about the whole thing, no one would have known it was him. That's well, my, think, my take on it. You know what was really weird for me, and I, I tweeted about this. Cody Walker goes to Souths and he says, listen, I'm getting, allegedly goes to Souths and says, listen, I'm getting blackmailed for 20 grand for this video of me kicking someone in a fight. And South says, go to the police. So it goes to the police, and within 24 hours, that video is picked up by all of the major media organisations in Australia and spread like wildfire by them. And I think that's really dodgy because they, so whoever this person was, they were allegedly asking for $20,000 or they were going to give this video to the police, uh, to the media. And when w- he decided not to, the media got the video. Yeah, you would have thought the media had. I don't know. I, I'd have th- if if Walker's gone and approached the police, I believe that's what's happened. Mm-hmm. Then surely that video is evidence, and therefore should not be out for public viewing until whatever cases it's referring to is dealt with. I would have thought. Yeah, and I mean, it's just so complicit in, you know, it's spreading it around. Yeah, and yeah. the thing they were saying it was it was on social media. I hadn't seen it until it was on the TV. Yeah, look, it's this is the problem too. Is if if you've got any footage and, and I've, I saw the footage, I can't see Cody Walker's face. I'm not saying it's not him, but mm. it's hard to prove it is. Mm. If he had to shut his mouth, I'm sure he probably could have argued and said, "No, nah, it wasn't me." What evidence have you got? Yeah, it's a it's a good point. I I just think that it's a really really toxic environment in the Australian media right now, where you can have a situation that is set up like this, and when he allegedly doesn't pay the money, the media just goes, "Oh, well, that's our green light now. We get this video and we put it everywhere, and well, we've got no responsibility and." I just find it really weird, and especially on the back of the way that players have been attacked for all sorts of different things, including driving a a car that was supposedly a quarter of a million dollar car and ended up being a $90,000 car. Players have been attacked for all sorts of different reasons over the last six to eight months, and a lot of it unfairly. And I just think this is the latest in a long line of really disgusting behaviour by the mainstream media. And I think that it's time that the NRL starts revoking some media passes 
I think that it's time that players need to be protected by from some media people. And uh, I think it comes down to the, yeah, just not allowing certain people to have access to players. Yeah, I mean, I think... Um, I don't even think some of those media people actually deserve to have access to the media. So I'm, I'm all for the NRL coming in and saying, you know what, if you're going to be... If you're going to treat us like shit, then... We're not going to give you access to anything in the NRL. You've got to earn it. Yeah, and I think that fans and people within the game would know the difference between somebody uh, writing a real story, like if there was something within the game that did need to be brought to the public's attention. There's a big difference between that and a lot of the grubby personal attacks that we've seen on players. Um, I think a lot of that is uncalled for. But I think, as it, you know, if the NRL started revoking uh, media passes because somebody uncovered salary cap rorts, I think everyone would go off their heads. Yeah, it's got to be justified. Like, you, I think I think a classic example is that utter gut, gut of trash that went on about Sam Burgess and his wife having a divorce. That's not mm-hmm. news that the general public needs to know about. It's not even news. That's just... that's. That's rather difficult stuff for someone to deal with when they're in the middle of it. That should not be splashed over a friggin' newspaper. I don't care how famous they are. Every mm. person has the right to some sort of privacy. Yeah, 100%. There was a lot that was written about a um, high-profile uh, person that was in the coaching ranks in the NRL a couple of years ago along uh, not similar lines, but it was just their personal life was being talked about by the media and it it had no place in the media. Yeah. And I do, I think, that clubs need to protect the people within their clubs. The media doesn't have this God-given right to speak to players and I think it's time that they start looking at the way that they allow accreditation for some of these people. Would you have a... Um... A three strikes policy, or would you just go with something a bit firmer, like one stroke? That's it, you lose it. Um, I as would in, just have as it. in the I'd accreditation. Just, yeah, I'd just have it as one strike. To be honest, you know, yeah, I think so too. Yeah, and look, it's I don't. It wouldn't be a for life thing, but no. I I would say like, I mean, some of the stuff that's been written about, say, Latrell Mitchell. You don't need to talk to Latrell Mitchell for the rest of the year. Just go away. You know, yeah. that's what okay. I would do. That, that could definitely work. Um, what are the chances of that happening under uh, Peter Volandis? Absolutely zero. Yeah. Yeah, that's a bit of a shame. It really is. He's I, bending I, over backwards for the media right now. Yes, well, you know, they're, they're just talking sweet nothings into his ear and he's getting a bit of excitement in the pants and so he does whatever they say. <laughs> That's pretty much what's going on at the moment, let's be honest. It feels like it, yeah. Mm. And we're, so, just being, we're just being forced to watch. Pretty much, <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I want to watch it, but still. Yeah. It's like a clockwork orange. Yeah, I, I've never seen that movie, but uh, I'm going to agree. People having their eyes, eyelids forced open to watch a screen that they don't want to watch. Oh, really? Oh, jeez. Mm. Yeah. So... He's brought in one referee. We've talked about that a little bit already. Yeah, now he's talking about wanting to just, I suppose, take the referee's head on if they decide to take industrial action. Um, yeah. I think the problem with a comment like that, which Mr. Vlandis would do do well to consider, is the fact that you will not have a game to play at all if you don't have a referee at all. I know he's been fed a lot of information from the uh, the, uh, Daily Telegraph journos who are really good mates of his. I mean, they spend a lot of time cleaning his ass with their tongues. But, um, yeah, he needs to realise that you do need to have an official on the the field. Yeah, Uh, and, like, there's a lot of referees employed by the NRL because there's a lot of games and they need referees that are up to standard. And whether people think they're up to standard already or not, the level below those referees is a level below for a reason. 
and there's not a disconnect either. I think that some people feel as though you've got the NRL referees and they're in this big bubble and then the New South Wales and Queensland Cup referees are just living in a completely different universe. They know each other. They work together. They, Mm -hmm. a lot of times, work in the same games. You know, you just don't realise it. And the idea that they're going to just step in and and be strike breakers, I think, is a little bit silly, you know. And and I could see referees well down the line saying, I am not going to be a scab worker for the NRL. Exactly. And I think one thing that's going to work against the NRL is because the media spent so much time, you know, absolutely absolutely rubbishing referees, Mm -hmm. what are the chances that a 19-year-old ref is going to say, yeah, you know what, I'll jump up and referee in the NRL, knowing how much they're going to get absolutely slaughtered by the press and by people on social media? Yeah, and not only that, also having the reputation of having been willing to do that. And then when the the professional referees and, and the, uh, you know, calling them professional referees, I'm, I mean the level that they referee at, uh, when they do come back and they will come back, how do you break into those ranks again knowing that you cross that line mm. with Peter Volandis? It, it'd be almost impossible. The only other way they could do it is if they went to the Super League referees and brought them over, which would be an absolute disaster, first of all. Second of all, I don't know that they'd get in the country. And then on top of that, they're professionals themselves. I don't think they would do that to their colleagues in Australia. No. And while the while the chance of having the Super League restarting this year is a lot slimmer mm-hmm. than, than the NRL... Um, if Super League does get back up, those referees are going to go back to Australia. Those are going to go back to England. So mm. you're kind of running a, a risky line there by bringing those guys over because you're going to lose them at some point. Yeah. And th- then you're also running the risk of, like, if the referees win their case in the industrial court, you are paying them, and then you're also paying the Super League referees and any, you know, small savings you're going to make are out the window. Exactly. So it makes you wonder why he's done this instead of, you know, he was quite happy to go to Channel 9 and negotiate their price down Mm -hmm. to give Channel 9 what they wanted. But the much, much cheaper referees, um, he's not willing to do a little bit of a negotiation with them and have a discussion with them. And they're not even, they weren't even asking for money. They were just asking to be consulted. That's all they wanted. And that's yeah. the, that's just the nuts part of this. Yeah, and the whole system that they've set up over the last probably 10 years, the way that they, you know, bring officials in as, as touch judges first and then they become pocket referees and then they take over as the main referee, that whole system's just been thrown out the window over the course of two weeks and half of them have been sacked and it's like, we'll take it or leave it. And they're like, no, that's not how this works, Peter. You know, and they've gone rightfully to the Industrial Relations Court. And it's it's really weird the people that you've seen attack them. I mean, Peter Volandis has attacked them. You've seen some people in the media attack them, but that's what the media does. They're soulless scumbags. Um, but then, like, seeing uh, Brad Fittler attacking the referees, I thought was disgusting. He's the New South Wales coach. How uh, Do you reckon he's... he'd be coaching New South Wales for half price? I doubt it. <laughs> No chance in hell. That's the thing, though. You know, Freddie and and Joey, they're both disciples of the Gus Gould commentary Mm. school, I guess. And that is, if you don't if you don't like something because it doesn't remind you of when you played the game, then you must bash the living shit out of it. Yeah, exactly. You know, and Brad Fittler, how many players in the whole history of Australian rugby league have made more money out of the game than Brad Fittler? And then he's turning around, having to go at the referees because half of them just got sacked out of nowhere. Yeah, I mean, it, most of most of Brad Fittler's career, he was probably earning more money than what a referee gets right now. Look, there would have been years during the Super League War he probably could have funded all the referees. 
And like, but seriously though, like, no, it's, not even it's joking. True, it, it's funny because it's true. Yeah. Ah. Oh. The nerve. I. It's. It's funny. You just hear people saying, "Oh, you know, without the fans, you got no game." Yeah, we found out at the moment that you can play the game in front of an empty crowd and it'll still go on. <laughs> We That's have so... never had a game played where there was no referee. Yeah. We we need the referees and this idea, this crazy idea. I mean, is there any better way for the media to set this up? The media scream and cry about referees all the time. And now they're pushing this idea that you can get ref, park football referees to referee an NRL game not even with a second referee, just by themselves. It's, it's just, insane. It's it just is more, just set up for failure. Yeah, it's just more of the derision of referees because they're just saying any Joe Blow can be an NRL ref. That's what they're saying. Mm. And you just know that the minute, if, if, if they do decide to go ahead and get you know forty five year old mechanics out there doing refereeing because they've done it once or twice on the, you know on a weekend seven years ago. Um. And they put them in the NRL, and they have an absolute shocker because that will happen. What chances the media comes out and says, "You know what? I think we got it wrong, fellas." Zero. <laughs> they will say nothing. Nothing. What do you They'll expect? Probably, probably give the rating a bloody eight out of ten. Oh, yeah, you got these two calls really good. Yeah. The, the, just the the physical toll of just getting up to the the physical speed of the game for somebody that's not used to it will be really devastating early on. Oh, yeah. It's... I can't believe he's picking fights with referees when the game isn't even on. Yeah. It's but, just not needed. And how much money did we lose in the TV rights so that didn't need to be negotiated? It's a really good question. And several it's hundred like, thousand? Uh, several hundred million? But this is like a game that is every year makes a couple of hundred million bucks. And they're like, all oh, right, let's, uh, I know, let's get rid of some of the referees off the field. It's like, really, there's nowhere else you can save money. Do you reckon Peter Volandis and a bunch of the people that work in the NRL aren't driving around in free cars right now? <laughs> That's a very good point. It's a very good point. Um, but look, and as we've discussed before, there's only one person in that whole uh, NRL administration who does who deserves the uh, the income they're on. That's old. That's the doctor two doctor two watches. Oh yeah, well he's worth every cent. Yeah, and he looks like he's he looks a million bucks too. Like he's and, just. And as you know, he's working. Yeah. Oh yeah. He's working, working. everywhere. Oh. He's he's working so hard he doesn't even have time to switch hands to see what time it is. He just looks down at whatever's closest to him. Yeah. Drops the old pants and uses that as a sundial. <laughs> exactly. And what a <laughs> sundial. Oh, cool. that thing's working. <laughs> um, what do you think's going to happen with the Industrial Relations Court and what they will rule for the referees? I think we're going to see two two referees. Referees will win. Um, and Vlandy's left to decide between either paying damages to the referees department or allowing two referees to come back. And Do you reckon at that point he says, let's just have one less player? I've worked out a way. I, I don't know. He's just He's just gone loopy. Yeah. He's really gone loopy. I mean, he's now what, looking at Changing the interchange because all of a sudden rugby league's not a sport anymore; it's an entertainment. Um, I can't believe I'm hearing shit like that. Yeah, and at the suggestion of broadcasters, like they're the ones that should be telling us what rugby league should or should not be. It's like, no, this is rugby league, and you pay money and you get what you get. And if you don't like it, you don't pay us the money. We'll go somewhere else. Exactly. Uh, I just, I don't know, saying it, saying we're in the business of entertainment, I mean, that just sounds like a line from Vince McMahon. You know, yeah. if you want to watch entertainment that's packaged as sport, then you watch the WWE. 
Mm-hmm. That's not rugby league. None of this shit's scripted. This is an actual sport, a legitimate sport. It's not an, it's not an entertainment product. It's a sport product. Sport by nature is entertaining. Mm-hmm. It's not just, oh, we just have entertainment here. No, we have a sport. It's got integrity on the result. You need to look after that. You need to have proper officials in there, not people involved in a made-up storyline, and have fixed matches, which is what the pro wrestling is. Sorry, everyone who thinks that otherwise. I just ruined Christmas for a few people there. Um, Wait a minute. Are you saying The Undertaker didn't sh- rise from the dead? Shh. Sh- <laughs> sh- Someone might listen and go, Mommy! It's um, me, damn it! I'm going to get a job now. <laughs> um, yeah, look, it's... I, I hated that line. When I saw it, it just, it's just a cringeworthy line. Oh, I'm mm. in the business of entertainment. No, the TV station is uh, in the business of entertainment. Mm. We're in the business of putting out a sport. Uh, and a real sport, not one that's just a, a fucking gambling medium. Exactly. You know, you exactly. can't just chuck money at it and say, oh, it's, it's the fucking Everest. You know, <laughs> the most gaudy bullshit in the world. That's bigger than the Melbourne Cup. You know how I know that? Well, fucking Everest is the biggest mountain in the world. So how about that? Fuck off. <laughs> yeah, that's um, that Everest thing is pretty funny, that. Ah, it's like, the most gaudy shit in the world. I know, but his, his mindset is the reason why the Melbourne Cup is the biggest race in the nation is because it's the one that has the biggest prize. Mm-hmm. If we have one in Sydney that's got an even bigger prize, then we'll have the biggest race in the nation. And all of a sudden, people are still going, yep, no, it's still the the Melbourne Cup. Yeah, and on top of that, like, the only thing it really does is it got a bunch of, like, horse owners around the world go, can you believe this fucking idiot is going to give this much money for a race in fucking Sydney? I'll be there. (laughs) Yeah, we'll be there. Yeah, I'll stand there and say, this is the biggest race ever, Pete. This is fantastic. (laughs) The whole Where's... world's talking about this. I'm not saying, man, how the fuck do they even make this work economically? <laughs> oh, boy. Do you reckon he's going to have an Everest race in rugby league? Just get Maybe. a bunch of wingers to have a race for $10 million? How long before the, the trophy they get rid of the gladiators and it's just a big, fat, juicy dick? <laughs> a big gold <laughs> cock. The Peter Volandis trophy. How about that? Big brass balls on the bottom of it. The rugby league. Rugby league. Rugby league. Rugby league. Rugby league. National rugby league. It's the biggest trophy in the world. It's got to be bigger than the uh, the Stanley Cup, though. So that and the Stanley Cup's like fucking what that, eight feet that, tall now. That, that that's a hell of a cock. That is a big fat cock. Jeez. How much girth to be on that that son of a bitch, eh? Can you imagine like can you imagine young Nathan Cleary when he wins the premiership this year and he's just cuddling the Peter Volandi's gold cock? He's got his arm can't even get his arms around it. Gives it a kiss. Yeah. They all of the t- all of the team, they sort of they uh they're sitting on the balls, you know, get, uh, underneath the trophy. It's rainy, a bit wet weather for the, but the, the, you know, crown of it just keeps them all dry. And then, then, right, then they set the, you know, the confetti off, and it spurts <laughs> out the cock. Uh, I'm coming around to this. Yeah, yeah, you've been inside too much, haven't you? I have. Yeah, I have. <laughs> I've only left the house for a porto. And I need to go outside. <laughs> wow. That, that, that went places. I know. I know. That went places. Can, can you imagine the crossover when they show the big rugby league Volandis, sorry, rugby league Volandis <laughs> cock and they put it alongside the A-League trophy? <laughs> That's going to be sexy. <laughs> oh, well. Um yeah, on that note. What else was there to talk about? Uh, well, you know, they're going to cut down to six interchange players, all six interchanges. Oh, yeah, the Matthew Johns idea. 
Yeah. Now, look, I like the idea, but I wouldn't introduce it after a broken season uh, where players haven't been able to train properly. And, you know, on round three, we just decide to do six interchanges. I think that's ridiculous. That it's man. What do you reckon his next rule change is going to be? I really do. I think at some point he's going to be like one less player. You watch. Well, I'm, you I'm watch. guessing no more scrums. Actually, Stop no. It. He he likes old things, so maybe he'll try and bring back the old contested scrum. Yeah, the referee feeding the scrum. Well, no, because there's no referees left. Oh yeah, it gets rid of the scr- oh, yeah. What about uh? Soccer's played over 90 minutes. Why don't we play over 90 minutes? With injury time. Make it like that classic game we watched last year. Yeah. yeah Imagine if every rugby league game went for two hours of actual play time. That would be incredible. So many more ads you could put in there. Timeouts. We need timeouts. You could play five ads in that timeout. Can you imagine how many times you could flog that Lego show in the timeout? Man, that sounds amazing. Yeah, and the, the amount of ad breaks you could actually have a, a Lego game of rugby league being played in the it ad breaks. Great, and then you could have Scott Cam flogging some really shitty DIY. Um, what else? Get Craig, uh, Tracy Grimshaw talking about how some people were chasing a dude out of a, I don't know, workshop house. or a house. Yeah, roofer. Yeah, know. that's um, that's got cams. Of- that, that's an amazing story, that. Mm. And amazing in a way that's not positive. No, no. Imagine how you'd feel. You've gone to acting college. You've gone through night or whatever it is. You've been in one of Australia's greatest TV shows. It might be Home and Away or something like that. And then when it comes around to Logie Night, you get beaten for the top TV entertainment award by a carpenter. It'd piss you off. Like, I think they should just all go to Georgie Parker. Well, yeah, why not? Yeah, exactly. Why not? Tell me why not. Yeah. Like Georgie Parker, she's still the, she's still putting in them hard yards on Home and Away. I have take your word for that. I've not watched Home and Away since ever. I've seen I've seen it every so often it comes on and uh she's on there. The weird thing about Home and Away is that, like every week it's like someone new has come to her. Summer Bay, why are they at Summer Bay? And it's like, who gives a shit? The interesting thing about this show is it seems to be all about home and not much away. <laughs> yeah. The show never it's goes always, on the road, does it? It's always, it's, you're always going to home. It's always at Palm Beach for some reason. They're always at fucking home. Yeah. I think the last episode I watched had someone called Bobby in it. Oh, really? Yeah. Last We're time, going, I used to... Go back I a while to, there. I used to watch it when... You know who's still on it? Marilyn. Wow. And she looks the exact same. It's really weird. <laughs> I'm I'm not even joking though. Like you look at her, she's got to be in her sixties or something, and she still looks the exact same. See, I remember there was, I think there was an actor that was in there, and his surname was Paps. Back in the late eighties, early nineties. Okay. And as a kid, I thought it was the same player who was playing for Cronulla and South, and his name was Arthur Pappas. <laughs> All right. Turned out I was wrong. They didn't look anything the same. I was just going off the names. That's fair enough. Uh, that's that's pretty much the extent of my home and away knowledge. <laughs> I spent my childhood watching Die Hard. <laughs> I spent it watching Platoon. Well, that's that's fair enough. I can I can accept that. Yeah. Now, Another thing that's been going on in the media is, is every now and then you'll see an article come up saying, you know, will will the premiers of 2020 have an asterisk next to their name? Oh, my God. I know. And this, this thing shits me to tears because it shows that the people writing it don't have any knowledge of the history of the game. And furthermore, if you don't have knowledge of it, it is really easy to find out yeah, just fucking Google it. Like, if if we scrapped the first two rounds of the Premiership and just had the remaining rounds that they're going to play, it would still be longer than a lot of the seasons by quite some way that we've had, where we've had legitimate Premiers. 
Yeah, we've we've had legitimate premiers every year up until salary cap scandals hit. If, if we're honest, mm-hmm. in 1921, they had um, they had a shortened season. So the year before that, they had 15 rounds. Mm-hmm. 1921, they had nine rounds. 1921, back to 18 rounds. And so that was because I think they wanted to get started on the City Cup competition, which was kind of like what England's got with the Challenge Cup. Yeah. And it became really popular really fast in Sydney. So they thought, oh, well, Premiership's over. Let's just tie that off and then just get into the City Cup. People want to see that. Mm-hmm. Um, in 1924, so just a few years later, after having 18 rounds the two years prior, uh, 1924 only had nine rounds. And this time I think it was because they wanted to have the – players who are going to get selected to play for Australia on the Kangaroo Tour to England, have them finish their regular season by making the regular season shorter so they can all get on the boat and head over to England. Mm-hmm. That's why that happened. The following year, 1925, um, another year where it was first past the post, which essentially means if you're the minor premier and you've got more competition points than every other team, then you're automatically awarded the premiership. There's no finals being played. Mm-hmm. In 1925... They were they were set to have fifteen rounds, I believe, and after twelve, they ended the season because Souths were undefeated, and they were ten points clear of the second place Western Suburbs, which meant they were never going to get caught. Even if they lost all their games, West won all theirs. South mm-hmm. still win comfortably, so they went. Let's just scrap it and then just start the City Cup competition early. Yeah, it, it and. You know, we've, we're going to have a, a bunch of rounds the rest of the year. Like, what would it take? You, say, what would need to happen? Say we do get to a point where we do have a grand final and, and the grand final is run and won, right? But what would have to happen between now and then for it, in your eyes, to be an asterisk season? Someone's through the salary cap. Like, there'd have to be the team that wins has to have won it illegitimately. Mm. That's how I see it. If the competition is set out and it's fair for everyone because everyone's got to play the same number of games and the final system is, you know, essentially a fair thing for everyone, as much as it can be when you can't do a full home and away draw, which we haven't done for bloody since 1981 anyway, Mm -hmm. I think. Or might have been 1987. Anyway, um, it's been a bloody long time anyway. Um, If the team that wins it is not, you know, genuinely legitimate that's when you put an asterisk next to it yeah other than that they're all they're all legitimate they're all fine i can't i just i i don't know why they're bringing this up it's almost like they're trying to create a story in the future you know imagine if say the warriors go through and win the premiership as their first ever title Mm -hmm. the media can say yeah warriors won their first title in 2020 kind of yeah Hang that against them the whole time. And say, For what purpose, though? And it feels like this, they are kind of setting up to do that for if somebody like, say, Parramatta wins. And it's like, yeah, but it wasn't a real victory. When it totally will be a real victory. Um, but they, I've, and I feel like there's certain clubs they do it to. Yeah. So we're going to have, is it 20 rounds this year? Yeah, I believe it is, yeah. Yeah. So the last time we actually had a full season that had less than 20 rounds other than Super League season was 1966. Yeah. Like, it's just one of those arguments. The media's putting out some real crap, and they're really showing themselves up for not really understanding any of the history of rugby league and, you know, people are seeing it and calling it out, which is great, but it's kind of shocking that when you see these people are being paid good money to write about the game and they really don't know much about it. Mm. It's it's absurd. That, that's one little thing that's been going on that irritates me. There was one other season that was also short, and that was 1937. That was also for the same reason as 24, because I wanted to start the Kangaroo Tour with, you know, everyone's played the full season so they can go off and do that. Yeah, yeah. That's happened four times before. And so, no one sits there and says that any of those premierships were illegitimate. I mean, a lot of people actually praise South for what happened in 1925. Yeah. Because it's the only time a team has gone through an entire season and won every game. Yeah, and the, the thing is, too, it, 
I'd like and back then the kangaroo tool was such a massive money spinner for the game so they the obviously the season was geared towards making sure the kangaroo tool got the most value you know that could out of it um and now and now it's very different it's having a as full of a premiership season and making sure we've got an origin series which we've got this year like and look if I, I don't think anybody's saying the same thing about the Origin series just yet, but I expect it will come up at some point. Um, and it's just lazy journalism. It's it's not even journalism. It's just lazy thinking. I I believe. Oh, it really is. It really is. That's something that's been irritating me. Um, anything else been going on, mate? Well, I found an article today. And I don't want to be too harsh on the person that wrote it, but it was on ESPN.com.au, which isn't really known that much for its rugby league content. But they did a list of the 10 greatest rugby league, the 10 greatest players in rugby league history. Okay. This is a big deal coming from the authority on sports news around the world. Yeah. And it was by the ESPN NRL editor. Now I'm not going to say his name because we're not about unfairly attacking individuals here, okay? And I just, I feel as though this list is so bad, I don't want it to be a pile-on for this dude. Okay. But with you being a a rugby league historian and me being a rugby league expert in general, Mm -hmm. I thought that when I saw this, I was like, me and Andrew's going to love this list. So it's (laughs) the top 10 players of all time in in the game's whole history. So we're going to go from 10 to to 1, all right? Okay, yeah. Okay, now, now... you and me haven't sat down and done our top 10 list and we're going to very soon. We've got plans to do that very soon, but you can just tell me if there's players here, you don't have to necessarily say, Oh, they're definitely in my top 10, but just would you consider them as a, a general top of the line? You know, that pointy end of the game's history. All right. Okay. Okay. So number 10, Ron Coot. Yeah, I'd, I'd put him in the uh, in in discussions with the top twenty, top twenty five. That's the same way I feel. Top ten, I don't know. I, I feel he probably doesn't make the top ten for me. But no, I the, wouldn't have him. I wouldn't have him in the top ten, but he's he's in yeah. the top twenty, twenty five. Yeah, he's he's in the the final fields. Yeah. You know? Number nine, Wally Lewis. Absolutely, yeah. Probably ranked a bit, a bit low. I feel I'd, I'd have him. I'd probably have him a bit higher up in the list, but still deserves to be in the top ten. Absolutely, yeah. Number eight, Bob Fulton. Again, same as Wally, should be higher up. Um, yeah, definitely does deserves to be in there. Yeah, and good to see an Englishman in here too. Oh, absolutely. Number seven, Jonathan Thurston. <laughs> Um, no. Yeah, I agree. Like I'd have JT probably in the top, maybe 50. I feel as though he's the top 30, but I may be towards the, like towards 30 rather than towards 20. Okay. Number six, Arthur Beetson. Absolutely. I'd also Number have him high up as well. I mean, he revolutionized forward play. Number five, and I feel as though you won't be a fan of this, Darren Lockyer. Not yet. I I love Lockyer. I think everyone knows how much I love Lockyer. Man, five five is pretty high. I'd put him in the top 30. It's it's too soon for me. Okay. Yeah, that's fair enough. I think it's pretty clear. A lot of people know that I'm, I'm not keen on putting in players who have retired any time in the last five, ten years. Or whatever it's been, probably even twenty years. I want to see a bit of a legacy. Number four, the great Reg Gasney. Absolutely. He, he's he's probably. I feel as though he's in the discussion for the top ten, and I wouldn't argue against him in the top ten either. You know. No, likewise. Uh, phenomenal player. I, I'm actually even happy to have him at four, to be honest. Number three, Andrew Johns. Um, 
I'd, I'd have him in the top 10. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't have him at three. I'd have him in the top 10. I would need to... I would need to think about where he is. I think I I I could see him in the top three, but I would need to sit down and think about it. I just realised too that I may have contradicted myself given my comments on Lockyer just before. That's all right. But That's all right. I think I don't think Lockyer revolutionised the way people played and hit the positions he played as much as Johns did. Um, and so that's probably why I'd rate John's a bit higher. And yeah, I I can give credit to John's for for what he achieved. I think he has been overrated a little, but I, in saying that, I still think he's one of the top ten. Okay. Number two, Brad Fittler. No. Yeah, I agree. I, I, we both I love, love Brad Fittler as a player. I love Freddie as a player, man. He was mm. phenomenal. I don't have him in the top 10, though. Number one, Cameron Smith. Are you serious? I'm, I'm not joking. Cameron Smith, number one player in rugby league history. Um, <coughs> Clive Churchill. Um, yeah. That's a glaring omission. Uh, I mean, there's, how do you, a few, there's how do you leave out few, Clive Churchill? How do you leave him out? There's quite a few immortals missing out of that list. But Churchill? My God. There is no... I, I would suggest that there is nobody that has any slight understanding of the history of the game who would leave Clive Churchill out of their top ten... And I would, I would even go as far as to say they're top five. He's hands down number one for me. I agree. I agree. Um, wow. He's I, not even on this guy's top ten list. I'm not even having Cameron Smith in the top top ten at this stage. Probably not even top twenty yet. Um, that's because he's still playing. It's not saying he doesn't deserve it, but as I said, like I, I want to see. I I haven't seen anything from Cameron Smith that says he's massively revolutionised the game. But his actual gameplay and the way he's, the style that he plays at is not too dissimilar to a few past players. The one thing that sets him out from a lot of great players is what's between his ears. Yeah, he's not faster than anybody else. Like if you wanted to have a fast dummy half, you'll get Damian Cook. If you want a dummy half who's got a really good short kicking game, you get Robbie Farrer. Hmm. And this is the thing. There'll be a few players along the way who are better at one thing than Cameron Smith at something. They're not going to be better than him at everything, but one aspect of the game will be better than his. And I think if also with Cameron Smith, you, you cannot ignore his longevity, obviously, because that is going to be part of his overall... Um, achievement as a player. I mean, he's the first one to 400, 400 mm. games, which is extraordinary for a hooker, especially. Um, and I think Cameron Smith, I rate him as the best hooker of all time. And even saying that, I, he's maybe is in the top 20 for me. I think maybe, but I would have to sit down and look at that. He's definitely not the best player of all time. Uh, 100% is not the best player of all time. I, I'm I'm comfortable in saying that as one of his biggest fans. Yeah, I'm I'm not a hater of Cameron Smith. I too am a fan of his, and more more in awe of him the fact that he's been able to play in the middle and miss so few games mm. for so long. It, that is truly remarkable. Um, yeah, I think for me. The players who I consider the top 10 players are players who changed the way the position was played. Mm-hmm. Like, they became the new benchmark. Everyone needed to have the next Clive Churchill. Everyone needed to have a Reg Gaznia. And, you know, you still hear people talking about the next Andrew Johns, the next Brad Fittler. Obviously, he was mentioning there. But, you know, they're players with a bit of X factor that stand out a bit and they're a bit bold. Um, I see Cameron Smith more in the mould of Cooper Cronk. And that's not a criticism. 
Mm-hmm. But it's more the fact that if you if you were to sit down in 20, 30 years' time and go, right, I'm going to look through some rugby league highlights from, you know, early, mid-2000 to 2020, and the first person that's going to come to your mind is not Cooper Cronk highlights. It's not going to be Cameron Smith highlights. It's going to be things like Matty Bowen, Benji yeah. Marshall, and it's because of that X factor. Andrew, Andrew Johns had it. It's that little bit of X factor, and it's, a, it's that X factor that changes the way people play the game because they bring something different to the table. And so change the way the game's played in a way that makes other teams go, we need someone like that. See, I, the way I see it, when you start talking about the top 10 in rugby league's entire history, there are certain players that, uh, and we, we're very lucky. We've got such a rich history in rugby league, but there are certain players that have come along at times in that game's history that have it, it's been like an explosion, like it, everything changed, and they have managed to have an era that is their era. Um, and like Clive Churchill, his entire playing time, it was when Clive Churchill played that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, Reg Gasney is an, another one. Like, you know, Reg Gasney exploded onto the scene. He, what what were we looking up? He was like the Australian test captain at 21 or something, 22, something ridiculous like that. Yeah, he took the record for the youngest test captain off Dave Brown. Um, and yeah. they were both like 21, 22 or something like that. It was very young. And I mean, Reg Gasney achieved everything he did in the game and retired before the age of 30. Yeah, r- absolutely ridiculous. Um you know, Arthur Beetson is another one. It's like all of a sudden this guy comes along and it's like, holy crap. Like everyone else, all of us, like how long was it before there was anybody that could really affect the game as a prop like Arthur Beetson did, you know? Um, there's certain players that come along and it's just like, even amongst the most elite players in the game, these players stand out in the whole history of the game. Yep. Um, and so there's, you know, someone like a Brad Fittler, and a fantastic player. He's not a top 10 player of all time, though. And that's not like at the, when you're talking about the top 10 of all time in a game that's been around for 120 plus years, you, you're starting to sound like you're nitpicking, but you have to because that's what you're looking for are these the as you say it's that x factor it's that something special um and yeah i couldn't believe it when i read this list and clive churchill that's the glaring thing you can you can kick holes in a lot of the rest of this list but to not have a clive churchill in there just for starters uh says to me that i don't know how you can be the nrl editor and not have him in your top 10 does that mean is it Arthur Beetson or Reg Gasnier is the oldest player in that list? Reg Gasnier. Yeah, Reg Gasnier. Uh, yeah, Reg yeah. Gasnier, yeah. Because, yeah, Ronnie Coote's after him. Which yeah. is kind of, it's kind of crazy. Well, it's because Reg Gasnier made his first grade debut, I think, in 1959. Yeah. So, they've just ignored 50, 50 odd years of football. Mm-hmm which is a bad move to start with, and then ignored some of the greatest players since then. Yeah. And, like, and you and me, I f- we feel the same way, I think, about Jonathan Thurston, like a fantastic player, achieved so much in his career, um, was a player with an X factor, was a, a winner at representative level. But I think... I feel, but I don't think either of us think of him as in the immortal class, do we? No. Yeah. And I did kind of laugh when his name was read out because I don't, I don't think he's near immortal class. No, I think, you but know... He, and He might be there in about 40, 50 years' time when we can't think of anyone else to add. And we go, well, you know, you go to that next sort of step down. If we have to include someone, we go to that next lot down. Mm. And it's not like it's a criticism again, but it sounds bad, but... You're still talking about players in the top, you know, the top 50 players of all time out of several thousand or several yeah, tens like, of thousand. 
I could see where he would make it because we were, we had Andrew Johns. I, I, like, there's no doubt he's an immortal. Yeah. Well, no, I, I don't think it's. I don't think it's up for debate anymore. Okay. I was so, very critical for a while, but you know, a bit of time's passed. I can't. I can't generally find a reason not to include him. Yeah. Other than I think other people should have been included before him, but I'm still pretty much saying there that he should be there. So. Yeah. You know. So, but it, say you've got Andrew Johns as an immortal, and it just so happens that someone like a, a Jonathan Thurston comes after him and isn't quite an Andrew Johns, but I would suggest that a Jonathan Thurston, I would have him ahead of, say, a Peter Sterling. Um, I'm, I'm, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, he is the next yeah. best. You know, and if we find that going forward, the next best is maybe at the level of a Cooper Cronk, then I can see where he'd come back and say, "Oh yeah, Jonathan Thurston." When you look at it, we've gone thirty years, and he's the he's he come after Andrew Johns, but he's still the second best halfback of all time. You know, so you put him in, but as it stands right now, I can't say he's an immortal. Um, it, no, it, anyway, I, this, I had to bring this list up because this is the sort of stuff that I know it, it absolutely infuriates you, it infuriates me, and we I had to address it on the podcast. Well, look, I think I think we're at a stage now where um, the top ten greatest players in Australian history is going to be largely accepted. Yeah, there's you, it's pretty much just going to be all the immortals. You just got to pick the order. That's pretty much it. Um, and we've got the most different reasons. So doing a top 10 list of the greatest players of all time, this just comes across to me as someone who wants to create discussion and they mm-hmm. don't care about the fact that they're going to get absolute hate piled on them. Because mm-hmm. they just go, hey, we're getting the clicks. You know, it's just saying that that's all we wanted was a bit of a chat. Um, I hate, I hate doing, I hate it when people do Things like that, claiming it's the greatest of all time, mm-hmm. and then making it obviously wrong just to create conversation. Yeah, same here. It's so dishonest. Yeah, I agree. And, and it, it does you know, no justice either if you're trying to become a rugby league writer. No one's going to respect you if you're just going to dish out shit just for, just for clicks and likes. Yeah, I agree. I know when I put together, and it's outdated now, I, it, there's a couple of changes I would make to it now, but when I was putting together my greatest rugby league team of all time on my website, and it was about 10 years ago, I think I did it, um, that was not a short process. Like, there was a lot of thought that went into that. There was a lot of research that went into that, and the the changes that I would make to it now are very considered changes, and one of them, and I, I think there's one that you probably know that I would agonise over, but I find it hard to not make that change. We're both going to put out our best players of all time, our best team of all time in the next, I reckon, month or so, I would guess. Um, And it's going to be interesting. And it's not something that we like when you put out something like that, that's like, it's almost like a test of your credibility as somebody that, is interested in rugby league history. And, you know, it, you don't have to all have the same team, but fuck, man, you don't have Cameron Smith as number one player of all time. Especially if you don't have Clive Churchill in the top ten. No. Can you imagine that if there was ten players that were better than Clive Churchill? It's That's ridiculous, that is. It really is. Anyway, I had to bring that up because... When I saw that, I was like, holy shit. <laughs> well, thank goodness there wasn't uh, Kieran Cunningham in there. Nah, he was probably 11 and 12 <laughs> and 13. Yeah, he's He's got 11 to 15, just nailed down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, dear. Well, well have there been any emails? There have been no new emails. We, we do have to get... Uh, what I'm going to do tomorrow, I'll sit down and I'll condense the couple of massive emails that we have to read out so that we can just sort of get to the point on our next podcast. Sounds like a good idea. Yeah. 
Alrighty. And there's been no comments. I mean, we keep asking you people and you keep not doing it. So, you know, fine. I'm not going to ask you anymore. <laughs> Write down, I refuse to leave a comment, five stars. That would be yeah. fantastic. <laughs> yeah. I'm leaving this comment here just to defy Andrew's defiance of us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Defy, defy, defy. Um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it, I guess. Yeah. I can't think of anything else that went on. Um, nah. I suppose there's one quick thing. Do you reckon the English Super League competition is going to get up and running this year? No. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of the same. Yeah, I just think that uh, I think by the time that they've the numbers allow them to start sport up again and how long it's going to take. I feel like it will, it takes about a month and a half to get all of your, your uh, ducks in a row. Uh, and I think that that timing and stuff, it's just going to run too late. I, I wouldn't be shocked if they do some sort of maybe play the, a condensed challenge cup or something like that, but I don't think we're going to see the super league season. See, I think they've got the perfect opportunity with the, with their competition size to run a very good quick competition over there and mm-hmm. still get a premier out of it. Cause they've got oh, what, yeah. 12, 12 teams in the super league. Yeah. It's 12 or 14. It's a good question. I feel like we did this once and we were like talking about how many teams there were. And then we were like, Oh yeah, that's right. No, it's, it's 12. Okay. Yeah. Six games a week. This is pretty easy. You could just have 11 rounds. And they've already played, what, five? Some teams have played seven games already? Yeah, that that's actually doable. And they're not going to have a... I uh, don't know why the Kangaroo Tour hasn't been called off yet, but anyway. You don't know what's going on there. Yeah. So, yeah, the UK, they could probably just play for two months and then have a grand final. Yeah, that's they've a got, good point. They've got, they've got that many games in the bank, so... I don't know. Maybe if the if the um, coronavirus has been sort of got under control there by even September, mm-hmm. they could still be looking at a grand final in November. Yeah, that's not too bad. That's not too bad. But you make a very good point. But it's the RFL, so I want to try and make sure they get about forty-seven games out of the season. Yeah, they'll be like, uh, look, we we could play these games and have a, a premier premier, but. We're going to play an extra 32 games because we've got to make some money. And the season is actually going to end in February, and then the next season is going to start in March. Yeah, there'll be no off-season. Yeah. You just finish on February 28, you'll get three days off for off-season training, and then we're straight back into it in March. It'll be great. That's the way my, to do it. My favourite competition with now semi-professional players in it. Brilliant. <laughs> They've got their head screwed on, those people in England. They really do. They see that's how you save money. You just don't pay cunts. Exactly. <laughs> Problem solved. Problem yeah. solved. What's that? Your minimum wage? No, 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 no. We can make that a smaller minimum. Yeah. Go and work at fucking Nando's. How about yeah. that? That's right. You might get a staff card and you get your Nando's cheaper as well. Imagine Everyone's a much, winner. Yeah. Imagine how much money the English rugby league plays. They wouldn't even have to sell their losers medals and shit like that, like he's seen ya. <laughs> All that silver. Yeah. Up the next day after the finals, always beautiful. Not a down turn into cutlery. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, on that magnificent note, thanks for tuning in, everyone. Hope you've enjoyed this episode. We've tried to not get too angry. I think we have anyway. Yeah, we failed at that, let's face it. Yeah, we, let's be honest, we did that again. We tried, sort of. <laughs> Maybe not. We know what you people want. You want us to get pissed off. Got to um, give the people what they want. Yeah. And you just got to give us a comment. Or don't. Actually, no, I don't. I'm going to try reverse psychology. Don't leave us any comments. Done. We don't even of. like comments. No, we're not even going to read them out anymore. Buggy yes. Um, And on that note, thanks for tuning in. Catch us all next time.